Hello, everyone. My name is Eric K. Thomas. I am the editor in chief of the Quintessential Gentleman. And today we are here with Mr. Richard Fowler. What's going on, my brother? How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing good. I'm doing good. He is a TV host. He's a radio host. He writes, uh, he's a journalist. He just he does a lot of things, and we're gonna pick his brain today. And super excited to have this conversation. So you ready? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Awesome. So first, just tell me, um, how did you get your background, or excuse me, how did you get into uh, kind of your start in this space? Either that was it TV first, or was it radio? So yeah, it was actually radio first. So I was doing radio for a couple of years, um, and I was sort of doing TV hits here and there, uh, and then. Uh, it sort of happened, like I tell people all the time, my story is very much serendipity and happened on accident, right? Like I, uh, after doing radio for some time, I was doing, you know, hits on all the cable channels. And then um, when Megyn Kelly went to prime time, right? Uh, at she, they were trying to figure out, like they were trying to match her with different people, like who was somebody that she could sort of debate with on the regular uh, and then we camera tested and the rest was history. Uh, we sort of really hit it. We had this amazing sort of on-air je ne sais quoi and we debated each other, but we debated each other in a way that was friendly. Like we could go from yelling at each other at, you know, on a 10 and then we'd end the interview. It was like, it's so good to see you. And she's like, it's so good to see you too. <laughs> um, and there's so many clips of us, like probably floating on the internet somewhere of like, audible laughs from her floor managers and everybody because we just spent the whole five minutes yelling at each other and then we end with oh it's so good to see you um and so that was history and that's how I got into tv uh and then I I think once I got into television I was already in radio uh I think I was trying to figure out like okay so what when when life god universe spirit call it what you will when it brings or he she they them when they bring, when it brings things into your life, you have to sometimes take a pause, right? You sort of lean, like lean back a little bit, like, okay, what, 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 what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to teach me in this moment? Uh, and I think for me, very clearly, very audibly, uh, it was this idea that you need to tell stories and you need to tell stories that allow people to number one, see themselves, um, number one, allow people to learn about what's happening, learn this, the, the plight or like give people the option and the ability to walk in somebody else's shoes for a day, for a moment, for a second. And two, utilize that to help shift, you know, the narrative and help shift power. Uh, and so I spent, and, and once I figured that part out, it was, my goal has always been, and it continues to be, how do I tell better stories? And how do I tell stories um, of both the people that look like me and the people that love like me, but also how do I tell stories about everyday people who you would never see show up on cable news or you would never see in the pages of Forbes magazine, right? Or how do I find, even when I have stories of, when I'm interviewing incredible people, how do I tease things out of them that tells a story that you didn't expect them to tell? And a case in point, a recent interview story I just did was I interviewed Ava DuVernay and you know, she was getting an award at the at the National Portrait Gallery, and that was a purpose of conversation. But I really wanted to talk to her about seven successful seasons of Queen Sugar. And Queen Sugar, as folks know, is a show that not only does it talk about like a family, three siblings dealing with the loss of their father and what to do with his farmland, but it also pulls on the strings of chattel slavery, chattel enslavement, and what has resulted from it in America. So police brutality, racial profiling, you know, the, the the drug epidemic that hit our communities. And while this is all happening, searching for identity. So when I sat down with Ava, I was like, so tell me, you're a storyteller. I'm a storyteller. What's the most fascinating storyline for you? Um, not a question that she expected, but I did that because it's like, I want you to tell me something. I want you to give me a story that my audience doesn't expect. And her answer was, I think, uh, very connected to the work that you do at Quintessential, Quintessential Gentlemen and the work that I do. She said the most, the storyline that I loved the most was the love affair between Ralph Angel and Blue Bordelon. And I was like, wow, I never thought you would say that. And then she went on to talk about how it's important it is to see Black men love each other, but it's even more important to see Black men love their children, especially 
you watch Queen Sugar, you know, Blue Borderland's not really Ralph Angel's son, right? He's loving somebody else's child. But I say all that to say that once I got to radio and I got to TV, it was about how do I bring people, how do I bring an army of people with me every day that I show up and I go to work? Um, and so whether it's that or whether it's being on air talking about the importance of, you know, Joe Biden's student loan forgiveness programs, I try to remember the people that are most deeply impacted by it. And I try to bring their faces and their voices and their stories to a different platform. Oh, that's awesome. What is the most challenging part about telling stories about people that look like you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and, and you know what? When I was thinking it, I was like, hold on, that is a good, it just came out of this conversation. I'm like, hold on, what the, I want to know. That is a good question. Look, I think this, I think we live in a society that we are divided um, by so many invisible boxes, boxes that are, aren't real. My mom was a registered nurse and growing up, she would always say, she remembers her first like gross anatomy class, right? Where they actually sit there and they have a human cadaver. And she says, when you cut open all these bodies, we're all the same, right? We have the same lungs, we have the same. And I should know the person that said that. She said it to me and then I was blessed to go to Israel mm -hmm. in 2018. Um, and I met somebody who survived Auschwitz, um, the Holocaust there. Um, I'm trying to remember her, Giselle was her name. Okay. And um, I asked her, what would she, my question I asked her was, what would you tell the Nazis if you had a chance to speak to them now? And she says, I just wanna know why they didn't see me as a human. Um, I have two ears, I have a nose, I have a mouth, just like they do have two eyes. We have the same body parts, but somehow they didn't see me as human. And I think the reason for that is because we live in a society globally where we're divided by all these boxes that every time you put a box an individual individual box between you and me it create it it, it takes it, to some extent it devalues mm -hmm. and it makes this distance between your humanity and my humanity right mm -hmm. so if i'm a straight heterosexual white man right who lives in the suburbs all these boxes say I have no absolutely positively no connection to a transgendered, you know, a, a transgendered black woman who lives in the nation's capital. We are so completely disconnected because all these boxes say sexuality, gender identity, zip code, upbringing, all these boxes say where we went to university, she didn't go to college and I did. All these boxes say that we're separated. And so the hardest part about telling a story of the people who look like me and the people who love like me um, is doing the work you can to force folks to see outside of the boxes that society has told them they should look through. Like almost like, you know, when you go to the ophthalmologist and they put the, all those lenses in front of your eyes, right? And so the goal is to what box can I take away? So take, I mean, we just talked about the student loan crisis, right? So how the student loan crisis has been portrayed by those in the media, call them who you will, yeah. has been this debate around ultra wealthy people who use student loans to go to college, who now want to be, who want to get their debt forgiven. The realities are, there's a lot of folks with student loans who aren't nowhere near ultra wealthy, right? There's a lot of folks who are dental hygienists, they're veterinary techs. Some of them are college dropouts, they didn't finish right yeah. or they went to a pre they went to a for-profit college the list goes on and on and on and on or they're teach they're your kinder your son's kindergarten teacher or they're your mm -hmm. daughter's or they're your daughter's earlyhood childhood teacher or they're your your aging mother's nurse's assistant and they use right. a student loan to get to get that job and right. those these jobs are thankless jobs and these jobs are jobs where we should be paying them like CEOs or we pay them like poor peasants regrettably so mm -hmm. my job is to slowly but surely break some of those boxes down because you think that everybody who loans are medical doctors and lawyers. No, and those people don't benefit from the program, right? The people that benefit from the program are the dental hygienists and are the veterinary techs and are the medical assistants. So when telling a story, I, I try to go to who, who's my, I uh, think about the first question of who's the audience I'm talking to. Mm -hmm. and try to put myself in their shoes and then I try to like 
deconstruct as many invisible boxes as I can to get them to the people that I know I want to bring into the room. It's complicated, and I'm not telling you that it's easy, but it's necessary. Um, and it's really necessary, especially because more and more our society is becoming more and more divided, and the dividing lines are, are becoming, there used to be lines, now they're chasms, and they're starting to become valleys that are dividing people from seeing each other as humans. And, and this idea that, like, I can't help the person next to me. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think we saw that so evidently during the pandemic. Right. Like and you would have the, like these amorphous conversations that just blew my mind. It's like so I live in the nation's capital across from me is Fairfax County, one of the richest counties in America. And they have 10 books. They only need three books. And they refuse like they can't give a book to the District of Columbia. Like, no, these are our books. And we can't give you a book because we need all 10 of our books. And I'm using this analogy. Obviously, it's Not a sure simplistic way of explaining a complicated situation. But it's like aren't we all in this together? I mean, and, and that's what the pandemic should have taught us, right? That like this virus could care less regardless yeah. of your age of where you live. Does it prey on some specifically? Yes, but it preys on them not because, you know, it's like I'm looking for, I'm looking for this particular person. It preys on them because of all of the externalities, whether it be a lack of, a lack, a, a lack of affordable housing. So they're living multiple people living in a place where they're only sharing one bathroom and somebody in that one house is infected or it's comorbidities comorbidities caused by health deserts and food deserts we can go on and on but instead you don't see the humanity in these people so it's easy to say oh well, it's not happening to me so i can keep my state open and i can close your you, you can close your state because it's not happening to me and it's never going to get here as if like you know <laughs> <laughs> COVID-19 knows borders and knows that she's entering the state of Florida or exiting the state of Texas, right? Like she has no idea. Um, but it's the job of a good storyteller is to be able to one, identify your audience, mm -hmm. and then two, identify who your whose story, which character you're trying to expose into or who you're trying what who you're what you're trying to tell them. And then put yourself, like put yourself on their sofa for a minute. And ask yourself, I might have my television right here, so that's why you did that. But and ask yourself, are they receiving what's coming across the TV screen? Or are they just going to change the channel? Right? So talk about your, your storytelling and how it's difficult. And you go through the different steps of what you have to do as a journalist in order to, in your opinion, correctly tell the story, right? So that it impacts people. Do you think society doesn't value real journalism anymore? Ooh. Because now Christian. we start to have these conversations that, um, or not even conversations, there are people who uh, are now, you know, you have blogs and things that just easy on the internet and just put up and people kind of run with it. But the work that goes into the research, the actual work of journalists, you, you don't see that as much anymore. It's so, it's so easier to get information out nowadays. What's your thoughts on that? That's a good question. So for a long time, I would not accept, I would not accept the role as journalist. I would not take the title on um, because I'm just like, I'm not like when people say, oh, he's a journalist. I'm like, no, 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 no. Because I think when you are a journalist and I think about some of the greats, right? Um, you think about, you know, Ida B. Wells and you think about all the journalists, not only, I, uh, you know, the Simeon Booker, all the folks that had like, these, bro these brothers had, and these brothers and these ladies had written amazing stories. Like those guys, covering the Emmett Till trial in you know racist Mississippi and being black reporters like those are the people that you admire and it's not that your journalism shouldn't have some level of activist to activism to it mm -hmm. right because they I would argue that those journalists who covered that case those black journalists who covered Emmett Till of course there was activism in their journalism exactly. but it wasn't our role, I think, as journalists is to tell the story as best as we can and to illuminate the characters as vividly as we can through our words, through our on-air presentations, and then to let the audience take those feelings. Like, it's not my job. And there, there are times where I'm doing an interview or there's times where I'm on air and I'm emoting because this story is compelling. But my job is to try to convey as much of that as I can to the reader or to the audience and let them take away with it what they will, but also understanding that I have to meet them where they are. I cannot start 
if you're in Miami, like I can't go pick you up in Orlando. I have to go to Miami to go get you. Like I can't meet you not where you are. And I think there's a lot of, there's, because we live in a world where there are so many blogs and there's so many folks who take on the title as citizen journalists. And I think they're, they're, there's, they have opened up space and necessary space for us to tell stories that we've never heard. Of. We've never heard of what happened. We've never heard of Mike Brown. We've never heard of, you know, George Floyd, if it wasn't for citizen journalists. And so I think they have a role and social media has made their role very impactful. There also lives a world for, opi for our opinion makers and people who come on and they, you know, their shows are opinion based, but there's a role in which for journalists that we must exist and we must continue to tell the stories of our people and define that however you will. Yeah. So you talk a little bit about the positive impacts of social media on journalism or news. What do you believe are some of the negative impacts of social media and its effect on journalism and how we receive our stories and news now? Well, I do think that social media and the and the, the the pace the pacing of it right creates a it creates a place it's like you have to feed the beast and in feeding the beast that's what leads to the, this this era of misinformation that we currently live in we live in an era of misinformation because it's this constant constant yearning to feed the beast and how that shows up and how that's impacted our news overall is i mean i think this past election midterm election was a great great i mean uh, i mean it's, it should have been the sign like all the alarms are blinking red right the media made because you had to feed the beast the media pollsters prognosticators forecasters made predictions based on some data like oh democrats are gonna lose it's gonna be a horrible red way it's gonna be a red tsunami <laughs> and when the red tsunami material didn't materialize itself People were like, but the reason why there was all of this prognostication and forecasting is like, what came first, the card or the egg? In this case, because we live in a world where I want to know who wins, I want to know who wins, I want to know who wins, and the impatience that social media has created, it forces folks to put themselves out there and make predictions, right? And literally, ask any of the, for all the interviews that I did, both on air and on radio, um, and even in my writing, I refuse, I literally, I think, I don't think I was, I do the Clay Kane show on Sirius XM every Tuesday. And that was like the first time that Clay was like, I'm forcing you to make predictions. I refuse to make predictions. I'm like, I, you can't make, if you have a taste of the electorate, you can't make predictions. Like it's just, and I say this as somebody, I'm blessed that I sit at this, like, if you live in Atlanta, then you get it. I sit like where the 85 and the 75 and the like 285 all meet. I sit at this amazing intersection of news and culture. And, and so like I all the, like I'm like, the, uh, the voters from where I sit, even like, you know, Fox, Fox News viewers at that point in time weren't necessarily sold on red. Like they were like, oh yeah, it's going to be red. But I'm like, yeah, no, they're not feeling it either. Like there was so <laughs> much uncertainty in the marketplace like you would hear when you hear republicans come out there and, and i don't want to make this too political but when you hear republicans come out there women come out there and say i'm a republican woman but the supreme court's decision on on, on overturning Roe v wade really impacted me that to me says you have an electorate of voters that are like yeah i'm confused and so you can't make predictions and everybody who made a prediction was wrong right because they because we live in the social media area to answer your question, the ideal of feeding the beast was more important than actually having a conversation with the people that are making the decisions. And I think also what we are learning more is that people are issue-based voters, oh, yeah. right? I think before it was this idea, you know, I'm voting Democrat because my daddy was a Democrat, granddaddy, all of those things. I still think Republicans are still kind of that, that way for the most part, but uh, I think we are, as the younger generation is starting to be able to vote, um, they are really like, if you do something wrong, I don't like it, I'm automatically changing it, right? Which, you know, I think is beneficial because I think that's how you should make your decisions based off your either your own livelihood 
or that of, you know, I guess what's right or morally right or whatever the case may be. So I think that's it. And I think I would add to that, that not only are they issue based, but they don't also vote on like they vote on what they they take up a, 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 a grocery store of items with them to the ballot box. Yeah. So when a voter shows up to vote, they're weighing the current economic state that we're in. They're weighing crime right but everybody sees like and that's what i said i think you have to understand that every voter sees this story a little differently so when you say crime is happening people who live in the black community are like yeah duh, we knew that part like crime <laughs> is happening like yeah crime is happening but i think every voter looks at crime differently if you're a suburban male voter based on the lax election you say oh crime is coming to my neighborhood if you're a black person who lives in a gentrifying or blighted neighborhoods you say well crime is happening but low-key it's not like crime is happening in lieu of over policing so like the idea of you hiring 10 more cops and thinking that's going to solve the problem i live in a neighborhood where uh that doesn't really that that math doesn't add up and we're all and we also need to be having a conversation of root cause because what i see happening around me is like 15 year olds running around the streets at seven o'clock at night. And so in my mind, I'm like, well, if you have to find space for them to go. And if mom yeah. and daddy, and for whatever the reason, because we live in a society where we haven't valued affordable housing, we haven't valued, you know, making wise investments in public education, we've created a world in which if you live in a place where disinvestment has been your reality, right? Where all you're seeing is them taking things away, taking things away, taking things away then the story is different, right? The story looks different in Ward 8, Washington, D.C. than it does in Fairfax, Virginia, or in Gwinnett County, Georgia. It looks different. And so when the story is looking different, you're going to have, you're going to take crime to the ballot box, but you're not going to take crime to the ballot box the same way that a, ver a voter in suburban America would take crime to the ballot box. So you might vote for a candidate that has both, who doesn't believe in the false choice between funding the police and actually reforming law enforcement because those two things can be done at the same time. But for another voter, they're like, yeah, I don't think this can be done at the same time. I've never seen it done before. So it, it's just, just people take different, people might take the same issues to the ballot box or they take those issues to the ballot box in different ways. Same goes for this plight that we see with gun violence. There's a lot of people who they own a gun and they go to the ballot box and they say, we need more gun control. But there's other people who are gun owners and they go to the ballot box and they say, like, they're trying to take my guns away, even though there doesn't, doesn't seem to be any evidence that says, you know, Joe Biden's out here confiscating guns. The truth of the matter is, is that that's the story you're being told. And that's a story that you now want to believe that's happening to you. And our jobs as journalists is not necessarily to make you feel like an idiot and say, yo, you're wrong. And here's the eight reasons why you're wrong. But our job is to meet you where you are. Right. And I've done stories on guns. And I always ask, why do you think the government's taking your guns away? What law or what did they say that got you to this point? And here's what the law actually says. But let's start where you are, because right now you think that they're coming to confiscate all your guns. Then you ask some other questions. Like, do you think it's OK for an 18 year old to walk into a school, buy a gun one day, walk to school the next day and kill 19 young kill 19 second graders? Like, of course not. So then what would you do? And then eventually what you find out is that most Americans would be okay with universal background checks. And most Americans would be okay with a three-day waiting period, right? But that's not the story that's, you know, teasing itself out in the mass media world that we live in because it's the, easy, the easier story to tell is to tell the story about the fault line, right? To tell the story about here's this dividing line, the line is the line is big, it's this, it's this many feet deep, it's this many feet wide, and not telling the story about why the line is divided and who are the people that live on both sides and what are the commonalities between the two people, right? Because look, the newest, I mean, I wrote a story about this last year, the newest number, the newest gun owner in America is a woman of color. Why? <laughs> and when you talk to women of color, they say, well, interviewed a couple of them. I don't trust the police and I don't trust the, I, I don't trust the police and I live in a neighborhood where crimes happening so it's a mistrust mistrust i don't trust the mob i don't trust the criminals i don't trust the police so i decided that i'm going to take protection to my own hands now 
this person to me is not somebody who is going to willy-nilly give their gun up in a gun confiscation type situation but this is a part this is a voter that if given a referendum or the ability they would vote for more gun control each and every single time but gun owner but you know but if you talk to the nra they would say that this person goes this way and that's not the reality exactly so you speak about um, kind of what is being perpetuated through the media um, and a little bit of like the narrative. I want to know, um, one, what does the media, what role does the media play in the narration of Black men? Uh, but then also, do you think that that has changed over the years? That's a really good question. Also, look, I tell people this. I say, look, we have to, Black oh, people of color big umbrella, smaller umbrella, Black America, smaller umbrella, Black men. We have to show up in every space that we can. And our the, the sheer nature of just showing up is important to changing the conversation, okay. right? We live in a world in which literally 50% um, it's one of the few play the few I I watched the vice vice president Prince's interview. It's one of the few things I agreed with him on. Like depending upon how you vote or how you politically align, you're getting your news from one source. Mm -hmm. So if we live in a world where close to 50% of our lawmakers are getting their news from one source, and another 50% of our lawmakers are getting the news from another source, if we're only talking to one outlet or two outlets that talk to this 50% of lawmakers, and we're not talking to those 50% of lawmakers, then we're making a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. Because laws... Whether you whether we like it or not, they all are sitting in a room writing laws, mm -hmm. and so we have to be having this conversation with everybody and anybody who's willing to listen. And then that's the sheer nature of just showing up, right? We're here, and look at my black face, and it's here. Number one, I think two is we've got to do everything in our power to break the stigma and to break the myth that exists around the black man. Uh, right and, and the and 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 that stigma and that myth that exists around the black man has created fault lines in other parts of our community right mm -hmm. so one of the reasons why i think there's such there's a divide between like black men straight black men and black gay men and the divide between the acronyms and straight is because there's this fault line the fault line was created that okay first at the end of the day i show up as a black man first you don't know how i choose to love until we start to have that conversation in to, to uh, if i'm driving home from a friend's house with a hoodie on all you see is a black man and so i show up that way first but we've got to begin to have these conversations and we've got to begin dispelling the myth the first myth we've got to dispel is the black fatherhood myth this idea that black fathers are not in the home that's not true yeah. right there are some yes there are some black fathers that aren't in their homes but a a, a vast majority of black men more so than hispanic men more so than white men black men are showing up for their kids and don't take my word for it just go ask the center for disease control who studied this right. right so i think that's thing one and i think thing two is we also have to acknowledge that we come in all different shapes and sizes and different lived experiences but it doesn't take away from us being part of the culture and from us being black men. And, and I think we've spent, we spent so much time in our community trying to define the culture, like this is for the culture and that's for the culture. But the truth of the matter is we're all in the culture and everything that we do on a regular basis, everything that each of us do every day helps define and shape the culture. Some of us aren't in the front seat. Some of us aren't in, like some of us aren't in the driver's seat or the co-pilot seat, but everything we all do every day is what helps shape the culture. And we're all uniquely connected and interwoven into this fabric and what makes black blackness so beautiful and i think what makes black manhood so beautiful is through all of our struggles and through all of the you know 400 years of slavery 100 years of state sanctioned jim crow then another 50 years of redlining the failed war on drugs over criminalization of our communities the fact that many of us live in health deserts or food deserts or you name the desert we're living in it is that we found a way to celebrate our joy. We found a way to display our artistry. We found a way to find identity and we've made those identities really beautiful and unique and we've made them different 
um, and, 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 and all of these things can exist together in, in a spectrum. And I think once as a community, when we do the work to realize that our beauty is within and all, and all of the fault lines that people say that we have that has been dictated and pushed down in our community, we're like, wait a minute, those fault lines are actually not really fault lines are actually really beautiful things that we can color in and we could, you know, give them different shapes and different sizes and different colors. That's at the point, at that point in time is when we'll actually begin to not only start to celebrate our own story, but then I think it creates this world in which when we're pushing back or when we're fighting for more and we're fighting to be seen or we're fighting to have a seat at the table, those fights become easier because we're united. And we understand that if I have a seat at the table, that means I have to create four more chairs for four more people. That might not all look like me. I might have to create a chair for a black woman. I might have to create a chair for a transgendered man. I might have to create a chair for a transgendered black woman. I might have to create a chair for a straight black man. Like it's just a creating all of these seats so that we all have a seat at the table and all of our lived experiences are acknowledged and supported and you know are seen. Uh, and, and I think you have to, this has to happen in a world where we're living in a society where in this moment, they're literally trying to erase lived experiences when they're taking, when you hear the banning of books and you hear them, you know, editing history, right? As if you can, right? Because when you, when oftentimes when you hear this editing history conversation, um, and I've been in some of the rooms as they're talking about how they all, you know, I'm like, so you want Martin Luther King there? Do you, so do you want all of his speeches or just some of his speeches? Because there's some of Martin Luther King's speeches that are actually very radical, right? Like, I mean, even in I Have a Dream speech as a stanza where he says, we've come to collect upon a debt that we're owed. Like, basically, he, it's, one would argue, many historians have argued that it was his, like, the, and the next step is reparations. Not saying that I'm there, but I mean, it's all, but like, my point is, when you say you were going to delete people from history, we're only going to tell you certain parts about certain people. How do you, how does that benefit the society as a whole? And how does that I ben benefit the children of color and the black children that are in those classrooms, right? That have to then go out and be positive members of society. But how could you be a positive member of society if you don't see yourself in the history books? If you don't see your story told throughout your primary K-12 experience? Yeah, no, that's that's so true. Um, I don't want to keep you long, but I have one question I definitely want to ask for sure, um, keeping an eye on time. So you spoke a little bit about the um, kind of separation between um, heterosexual Black men and um, members of uh, the LGBTQ community and specifically Black males in that space, right? I guess, do you believe that at some point that relationship will be fixed or nurtured to where there will be a better relationship between those two groups and oh, absolutely okay and how? Absolutely. how how can you how can you fix that uh, listen i think the greatest weapon that we have is a storytelling man i i mean they call me an idealist and call me uh, call me sappy um but i think <laughs> storytelling is the greatest weapon that we have to fix this right mm -hmm. because here is what we know same as with other communities these individual boxes that exist between black straight men and black gay men are not real right because it's this allu it's illusions the, there's an illusion that you know and there's so much mis there's illusions and these illusions have been the have been the sort of cornerstone of misinformation right so you have illusions or there's well, they're different than me and then you stack that up with all this misinformation you name the person spewing it, I won't even waste my time in bringing up all the different myths that you hear, right? The only way to break through all of that is by actually having lived experiences and hearing somebody else's story. And what you notice, at least from my storytelling, is people who have somebody very close to them, intimately close to them, brother, sis, brother or sister or cousin, who is part of the LGBTQIA community, they're often the first to be like, oh, well, at first I was taken aback by it, but then I realized that I knew this person, right? And I realized that like, so they love differently, but they're, they're the same person. So that means that none of this, none of those boxes that you thought at the beginning, because when you, when I think oftentimes 
in our community specifically, we, and maybe this might be radical, maybe a radical thought, but I think it's true. There's this weird narrative that the LGBTQ black folks are and their proximity to whiteness. Like if you're gay or you're lesbian, you're white. Right. And so like that is the that's the idea. And it's not, once again, very similar to the other theory of the case, right? And so I'm living over here and you're over there. But when it starts to be, when it starts to happen in your house, right? When it starts to happen at your family reunion, when it starts to happen to a close college friend, all experiences that I've had, you realize those lines and these boxes, they just seem to vanish in thin air. Which says to me, it's because one, that person either shared a lived experience with me or they heard my story genuinely. And so I think in sharing our stories, right, um, we can build bridges. Um, and in building those bridges, we can create some unity. Uh, and, and the truth of the matter is, is that I think that is some of the, and it, the work is happening. Is there more work to be done? Of course there is. But we've made there's a lot we've made a lot of progress um and it, i mean take it back to take it back to bayard rustin right like there were he they, he literally had to he had to deduce himself down even though he was the planner of the march on washington and i wait for his movie on netflix to come out. oh yeah i can't wait, for wait. <laughs> I, I can't wait for the movie to come out right but he had to deduce himself down because you know, the whole idea of it was he was a threat mm -hmm. to the progress of the movement. We knew, we know the FBI was monitored and all this other stuff, right? But he had to do himself down. We no longer live in, we no longer live in a world where, hold on, we no longer live in a world where that's true anymore. You can be your authentic self and live in community, right? And I think now more than ever, it's about breaking down the boxes and also taking us out of what I like to call like, you know, these, the poll, these polls, right? The poll, like, I mean, I think there's this belief that, you know, gay men or LGBT community lives in these, like, you know, these vast extremes. And the truth of the matter is 99% of us live somewhere in the middle and we're none of those extremes, but we have to take the boxes away. So you see me not as somebody, not, you don't see me how I love first. You see me as a man first. And then we get into all those other, we can get into all those other chapters after. But part of that, to answer your question the short way, is the power, we have to, we have to use storytelling as a tool to break that wall down or to sort of fill the chasm brick by brick, stone by stone, right? It's like, because what you see happening, um, and I think it's beautiful, is people are starting to, it's, start, it's starting to hit people. And like, you notice, like, it's starting to be like, oh, yeah, 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 you can't, like you see people like, oh no, my cousin, my, my brother, my sister. And so now I can connect with you because it's happening close to me. And so it's about sharing those stories. And I think when you have storytellers out there like Ava DuVernay, and when you have other storytellers out there, not only her, but Lee Daniels and others, Right. Yeah, I would always say um, P Valley. Like, yeah. I always um, to P Valley. Uh, Katori, Hall, Katori Hall at oh. P Valley. And I got, I mean, I had a chance to interview. J. Alfonso Nicholson, or the guy, the character who plays P. Murder, mm -hmm. a little murder rather. And we talked about these lines and he says, what the show means, here's the thing, that show had critical acclaim in the black community. And whether you were straight or whether you were bi or whether you were non-binary or whether you were gay or lesbian, you were watching that show and you saw how all those lines mixed. And even in, you know, when I interviewed J. Alphonse Nicholson, we talked about Little Murder's glares, like who, the like especially in that fi the final two episodes, right, where he's looking at little Uncle Cliff, but he's looking at Meg the Stallion, and he was like, well, and he answered it perfectly. He was like, well, in Little Murder's world, he loves Uncle Cliff, but it doesn't mean he's not going to take a look at Meg the Stallion when she's walking by. And that, t and, oh, and, and, tell and when Katori Hall tells a story like that, that allows you to see a character like Little Murder, who to the to to the actor's credit said he lived in my neighborhood right right so these people who live who live who you just don't assume that they're they, they're they're sharing these dualities and glances what you're able to create is a well say well maybe my maybe maybe this is closer to me than i think it is right and i mean what you found was and when you look when you listen to the actors and, and you know their pr teams they say more people were rooting more straight people were when they went to essence festival more straight men came up and were rooting for uncle cliff and little murder to be together than they thought. 
And I'm like, of course, because I think we're selling our community short to think that we can't make these linkages if we use a story as the vehicle right to get you there i think what we've often tried to use is we try to use tactics that work for other communities but not our own our community i mean if you go back to how our origin story right we are a community that's built off of storytelling and stories being passed down in villages in all parts of the continent of africa right so the idea that our liberation is in our stories actually makes perfect sense right because that's who we are that's in our genetic code is that like we are storytellers right and like literally had somebody in the village that was their job right to tell this like the storyteller of the village came and told you about the village's history and told you about your ancestors through the power of story and so as more and more of our stories get told on television and on the internet and on social media and you have more you know directors and journalists like myself and like yourself, anybody, right? Tory Hall's telling these stories that look differently and show up differently. And even the work that y'all are doing, Quintessential Gentlemen, of saying, we're going to show you Black men in all different colors, different shapes, different sizes, different sexualities, all of this stuff. And I sort of say, well, wait a minute. Let me take a step back from what society has told me and just digest a story that's coming from my own because I'm more likely to trust that storyteller. I'm more likely to trust Katori Hall then I might be to trust an Aaron Sorkin, even though I like Aaron Sorkin, right? Like it, but Katori Hall is talking about a lived experience that I know, and she's doing it in an authentic way that merges all the different parts of, like I said at the beginning, our artistry and our shapes and our colors and all the things that we've, all this beauty that we found through pain. And she's found a way to tell it so masterfully that of course we would respond to it in that way. And even in um queen sugar ava duvernay the same thing right she said i'm going to give you the stories that you know but then i'm going to met like it, it, when she messed around with nova's character but nova's going to struggle with sexuality and how many people do we know right when you actually pull the tea leaves so how many people in my own family might be struggling might be struggling with sexuality and are, are are doing it in silence because they can't share their story they don't feel safe to share their story with a family member Right. And so it causes us to open up stories as a weapon causes us to sort of open up space to tell different angles and different ways. And, and I think that's the power that journalists, journalists have. Like when I told my gun story, I included an LGBTQ gun group, a black LGBTQ gun. Why? Because you need to see gun ownership outside of black men. If I'm telling a story about guns and, and, and black, the black community, the assumption is I'm going to tell you a story about a whole bunch of black men who own guns, yeah. Yeah. but I'm going to actually throw that. I'm going to break that egg for you real early. And I'm going to tell you about an LGBTQ group where lesbians, gay folks, transgendered black women are coming together and learning how to shoot a gun. And, and the person who I quoted, who runs the group said this, at this point in time, when you have so many unsolved transgendered murders, you have hate crimes at an all time high. Some of these hate crimes, this was her quote, not mine, but some of these hate crimes are being done by the people that are supposed to be protecting us, police departments, et cetera. We have to be, we have to arm ourselves and we have to know how to use the second amendment to our benefit in a world in which it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Of course, we don't want it to be there, but in a world in which it's not going anywhere and our lives are threatened, then of course we gotta do it. But that's not an angle that any gun owner, I mean, I know I know folks at the NRA read my piece, folks at like the National like Gun <laughs> Owner Association, but I wanted to give you something different, something new, something that, would make you say, but wait a minute, right? And that's an and that's and that's the fun about like that's the fun in journalism is being able to like when I told a story about cannabis dispensaries, but I found the one of the few black women in the country that own her own license. Why? Because it's a completely different angle on a story on an industry that was once legalized. Now eighty percent of the industry is owned by white men. To have a black woman say, "I'm the hundred percent owner of my license. I run a cannabis store." in the middle uh, on Martin Luther King Boulevard <laughs> in Ward 8, across the street from the big chair, a block away from Frederick Douglass's house, her story matters. Her story needs to be read by audiences in Forbes. And in telling her story, I've hopefully broken down some stigma around the drug. I've also hopefully inspired a group of entrepreneurs who are Black women who want to go into the industry. Like the goal is to do something different and doing something different and when some people see themselves reflected 
you know, they use, they can see the story as a weapon to push forward, to push on, and to also at the same time push against, you know, and I hate to use the word system because I think that's a loaded word, but to push against inequities as we are, as we all push against inequities together, they're doing their own singular push. And that's why I think you're starting to feel this shift happening in culture, right? And I think what we're experiencing now as the shift is happening is we're experiencing the folks that want to snap back to a, 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 a past that is decades ago. And I think they, and and I think what this election taught us is that those folks who want to do that won't be in the driver's seat in the next decade. No, I agree. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so last question is what can we look forward to from Mr. Richard <clears throat> Fowler? Um, listen, I'm going to keep telling stories. Um, that's what I'm called here to do. I believe that's what I'm called here to do. So that's not going to change. Um, where I tell, I mean, I'm going to keep telling stories. Where I tell them, we'll have to see. But I will keep continue telling stories. Um, and hopefully those stories will take me to wherever God wants me to be. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us and having this conversation. It was amazing. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the time. I appreciate it. Of course.